Okay, we will get started. It is noon. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, I think some of you have joined us before. This is our fifth webinar partnership with Consolidated Planning Group. Um, I am Natalie Hendricks. I'm the Social Services Director out here at High Point Village. We're out in West Texas. We are a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to serving those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We have um, a daily enrichment program for adults ages 18 and over. We have afternoon enrichment for ages eight and up. Um, summer camps are also for eight and up. We have therapies for all ages, music therapy and speech therapy. Um, we do have respite nights. So we give caregivers a break here on Friday nights every couple of weeks. Um, and then we do have a vision for residential. We've got 62 acres out here and it's always been our vision and our mission to have um, a residential facility. So that is forthcoming, it takes a while. Um, and then social services, which of course is where I come in, uh, resource connections and mental health support, et cetera. Um, and so that's how I've become um, connected with Consolidated Planning Group. They are a wonderful resource and they are also today partnering with Trustee Weeks. Um, but on our website, if you are like me and you like having information in multiple formats, you can go to www.highpointvillage.org to learn all about all of our programs, but also under the social services tab, I've typed up documentation on a lot of these resources and all this information. Um, so you can go there on today's topic as well as previous topics. Um, I've been given permission to link the webinars we've done with CPG um, on our website. So you can go there for extra information. But um, thank you guys so much for being here. Allison, I'll kick it off to you. Thanks, Natalie. It's always a pleasure to partner with you guys. It's nice to be back with you. Um, Allison Scobrick here, Consolidated Planning Group. Um, today, uh, we are excited to be partnering uh, with attorney Tressie Weeks uh, from the Weeks Law Firm. And we're um, going to be talking about special needs trust. And uh, as a lot of uh, families know, there's a lot of uh, ins and outs that kind of goes along with the trust. And um, th there's a lot of why behind that. So we're going to be talking about that. We've got a lot of information to share and we've got a lot of people uh, that are that are on today so um, from a housekeeping perspective I always just like to hit the hit the high points um, today's webinar is being recorded it will be shared on the consolidated planning group YouTube channel which you can subscribe to for free there are over 250 webinars out there on um, special needs um, planning topics so you can kind of peruse those topics for kind of the stuff that you are on um, on your journey um, for planning purposes. We're going from 12 to 1 today. Uh, everything is being recorded and all participants that have signed up for today will get a copy of today's slides um, also with a link to the recording. So we are in webinar mode today, which means that we can't see you or hear you. We do know that you're there um, and that we are glad that you've taken the time uh, to spend your lunch hour with us today. Um, one thing that we're going to do a little bit differently today because of the, the, the content and um, a lot of the slides are going to answer a lot of the questions today instead of taking the questions throughout like we normally do um, we're going to take the questions in the end you can put the questions in the chat box um, you know at any point but we're going to be addressing those questions at at the end today so um, you know I always just like to just kind of mention um, next slide please Tressie um, you know the the differences of what we do and what um, what an attorney does because you know oftentimes we are getting phone calls all the time saying hey I need guardianship or I need a special needs trust um, we absolutely don't do that that's not what we do um, we work very closely with people like Tressie Tressie uh, the attorney uh, the estate planning attorney uh, nuanced and special needs. It's going to create those documents, those trusts, the guardianship, the wills, all of those legal documents. We do not create documents. We don't uh, review or give credit or take away credit from any of those legal documents. Um, but what we are is the money. We're the money in the right buckets. We're nationally certified as Social Security Advisors, members of the Special Needs Planning Ac Academy. We're an advisory and consulting firm. People come to us and they say, how much money do I need to fund my special needs trust? Where can I have money that's going to preserve eligibility for state and federally funded programs? How do I make sure that I have enough money to spend 25 to 35 years in retirement and still fund, um, you know, the care for my loved one um, that has special needs? And quite honestly, some families have more than one child with special needs. So it's a pretty tall order. 
Um, we do a, a lot of advisory and consulting. Um, we, we, we do a lot of um, grassroots and education through our webinars, which typically run um, from 12 to 1 during the week um, to, to really put the tools and resources in your hands uh, to help you feel equipped that you can be successful in planning for your loved ones. So having said that, I am going to um, turn everything over to Tressie. Tressie, it is certainly uh, my pleasure to be here with you today. We're happy to have you back. And we are excited for you to go um, through um, through your slides with us today. Really good stuff. I've looked at them and this is, this is good stuff. So thanks so much, Tressie. All right, Allison, thank you so much. And what you do is so vital um, for families. So I'm so glad to get to do this with you. Um, what we're going to talk about today is the top 10 questions we get about special needs trust. So um, I'm with the Weeks Law Firm. We are in Plano and we serve families all over the state of Texas. And we help families along with people like Allison to plan for the future of their child with special needs. So Special needs trust is my favorite topic. I love talking about it. So when I'm going to talk about these trusts, I'm going to use some case studies or scenarios. So these are not real clients because of attorney client privilege. I am not telling you about my real clients. If you are my client, I'm not telling anyone about you. But these are based on real situations to illustrate the points we're going to make today. So let's imagine Izzy. So Izzy is a young adult. She lives at home and she's having a great life. Um, she lives with her parents. She has all of her friends that she grew up with, an online business. She has a blog. Now she's getting SSI, which gives her 914 a month toward food and shelter. She gets me basic Medicaid, but she's got health insurance through her father's employer. So that is helping there. And then she's on some Medicaid waiver programs. And these programs are actually paying her mother to stay and care for her, pays for caregivers, attendant care, nursing care, diaper supplies, all kinds of things. Because of those Medicaid waiver programs, she's able to stay at home. Her parents were so busy giving her a good life now, though, that they forgot to plan for the future. And unfortunately, her parents passed away. So her parents weren't wealthy, but they had a house, cars, bank accounts, IRAs, 401ks, life insurance, because they had no attorney and no planning. All of that went to Izzy outright. Izzy now has too many assets. She does not qualify for SSI and Medicaid. She also lost her father's health insurance plan. So she's got all of the assets from her parents with no government benefits. So she could buy a health insurance plan on the open market, but it's not going to cover much. Um, a lot of her doctors won't take, um, take that plan. But also because she's lost all of her SSI Medicaid, everything that her parents left her has to pay for everything out of pocket. So all of those diapers and supplies and attendant care, things that have been covered by benefits are now paid for out of pocket. Also, she now has to pay someone to do what her parents did for free. So as you can imagine, the assets that her parents left her, again, without legal, without any proper legal representation, those assets will run out at a certain point. After a number of years, everything's gone. So Izzy is destitute at that point. So she can reapply for SSI and Medicaid and she'll get it. But what does that get her? Well, that gets her 914 a month for food and shelter and then basic Medicaid and then some of those waiver programs. So Izzy can no longer afford to live in her home. All she has to live on is what the government benefits pay for. And because of that, Izzy, unfortunately, ended up in an institution. She had a room in an institution. She lost her, it wasn't in her town. So she lost her friends, her online business, her blog, her comfortable surroundings. Everything that she had enjoyed is now gone. So it's not the outcome that her parents would have wanted for her if they had planned ahead. 
Now let's imagine Andrew. So Andrew is a young adult and he is also getting SSI and Medicaid and he lives in a group home. But this group home costs more than 914 a month. But his parents pay that because they want him there. He's in the town or the suburb where he grew up. Um, he likes the guys that he is roommates with. He's got activities there locally and he's in familiar surroundings. His parents wanted to make sure he had a good life. So they saved their money their whole life to care for Andrew. They knew that if they left their assets to him outright when they died, that he would lose SSI and Medicaid. So instead they said, why don't we leave everything to our daughter, Susan? Because Susan loves Andrew. We know that she'll use that money to take care of him. So the parents passed away and all of their assets were left to Susan. And sure enough, Susan loves Andrew. She uses that money to care for him. She pays that extra for that group home and everything's going great until Susan died. So if we were in a room together, I would ask you what you think happens to that money upon Susan's death. We get a lot of different responses, but because those assets were in Susan's name, they were distributed according to her will. Now, Susan and her husband and teenage kids lived in California. And so her will left everything to her husband and her kids. So her parents' money that had been saved for Andrew ended up going to Susan's family and not to Andrew. So at that point, Andrew is destitute. So he's got nothing. So he can no longer afford to live in that group home. So he only has $9.14 a month to live on for food and shelter. So really he lost his choice of where to live. So he ended up living in a group home that was paid for by the state, but because he didn't have a choice, he ended up in one with some guys that weren't very nice. It was not in the town where he grew up. So he ended up in a group home with the mean guys and didn't have all of his local friends and all of the local activities that he had been used to. So even though the parents save their money. It didn't work out well for Andrew. Now let's imagine Kyle. So Kyle is also a young adult getting SSI and Medicaid, lives in a group home, and he has a job. So he works at Kroger and he's a, a bagger at uh, Kroger and he's really popular. This is the Kroger in the area where he grew up. And there are a lot of people that will come to his Kroger just to chat with Kyle. So he's got a great social system there. Now, his dad knew that if he left money to Kyle, he would lose those uh, government benefits. And so the dad created a special needs trust. And he was needing to name a trustee to manage the trust when the dad died. So the dad has a brother, Bob, and he's a CPA. So he said, I'll name Bob as the trustee because he's good with numbers. So dad dies, his assets from the sale of his house, his IRAs, 401ks, life insurance, all of those things go into this trust. And Uncle Bob is the trustee. But Uncle Bob lives in another state and he doesn't really know Kyle. He doesn't have a relationship with him. Uncle Bob is looking at the numbers and he says, well, I think it would be... Um, better if I make Kyle move up to my state. It's a little bit cheaper in my state. And so that's what happened is Uncle Bob moved Kyle up to that state. And of course, Kyle lost his surroundings here in Texas that he was comfortable with. He lost his job, um, lost all of his social support system. So his basic needs were taken care of, but Kyle didn't like the climate of this new state. He didn't find the people friendly and he was miserable. So even though his dad thought he was doing the right thing, he didn't. So in all three of these scenarios, we can avoid these negative outcomes by planning properly. So first let's talk about government benefits. We're talking today about SSI, Supplemental Security Income. This year, the maximum is $9.14 a month, and it is meant to be used for food and shelter. Medicaid is what we're talking about, which is basic health care. And then there are Medicaid waiver programs. You may be familiar with CLASS or HCS, some of those. These programs can provide different services, such as attendant care, respite. 
therapy, residential supplies, different things. To be eligible for SSI Medicaid, an individual must be sufficiently disabled and have low income and limited resources. Now, I'm going to talk about the basic rules for SSI Medicaid, but keep in mind that the Medicaid waiver programs each have different eligibility requirements. So if your child's on one of those waiver programs, you want to look and see what those requirements are. So to be financially eligible, your child needs to have less than $2,000 in countable resources and less than $2,000 in monthly income. So even though they're both $2,000, your child has to meet both of those requirements. So let's first talk about income. If your child is getting SSI, then whenever they receive wages, that's going to reduce their SSI check. If your child's making, this is $1,100, it's probably closer to 1300 If they're making a lot of money each month, they probably won't has the definition of disabled. If they're not on SSI, they're on Medicaid, they can have up to 2,000 in monthly income or less than 2,000. So what is income? We know if your child is working and earning wages, that's income. But because SSI is for food and shelter, if someone provides food and shelter, that's considered income to your child. If somebody gives your child something that be, can be converted to food and shelter, that's considered income. So if someone gives your child cash, that's considered income and reduces their SSI check. Now, under the deeming principle, when your child is under 18, the income and resources of the parent is deemed to be that of the child. So a lot of people are not eligible for SSI until they turn 18 because the minute they turn 18, SSA does not look at the income or resources of the parents. Now, if an individual's SSI check is reduced because of income, keep in mind that as long as the individual receives at least $1 of SSI, they automatically are eligible for Medicaid. Now, this is the rule in Texas. If you're in a different state, you might want to check the rules of your state. So let's say that your child is living with you. So you are providing food and shelter for your child. Under a principle called in-kind support and maintenance, they can, what you can do is take a one-third reduction of the SSI. So if your child's living with you, their SSI check is reduced one-third of the maximum. Now, there are some ways to avoid that one-third reduction. The most common way is for your child to pay you rent. They would enter into a written rental agreement with you and then pay you rent. Um, in my area, the typical amount we see is $500 per month. If you do that, then you can get the SSI moved back up to the full amount. Tracy, um, on that previous slide, um, two back, I just wanted to mention that for people that are thinking about applying for SSI, um, it is okay if your child is working. Um, a lot of kids are in the VR program or um, pre-employment training services and things like that. Um, when you're applying for SSI, um, it will be denied if the child is working earning more than the substantial gainful amount, which for 2023, that substantial gainful amount is 1470 gross earnings per month. So if your child is working, it is okay as long as they're earning less than that 1470 gross earnings per month. And that's for SSI. The 1470 gross earnings per month is the litmus test for um, SSDI for the life of the social security disability claim. And so that's probably a whole nother topic, but I just wanted people to know, cause I know sometimes people have had their kids working and then they make their kid quit cause they wanna apply for SSI and it's not necessary. You don't have to do that. And there is something called the student earned income exclusion. If they're a full-time student in any capacity, homeschool, public school, private school, community college, university, um, transition program, the student earned income exclusion where you can have that income excluded between the ages of 18 and 22. Um, so that's a, that's a whole nother rabbit hole, but I just wanted to mention that to people. Don't make your child quit the job, but you should just be careful that they're not making more than 1470 gross per month unless you feel like for sure that they could make that and more, and then you probably don't need SSI. So I just wanted to mention that. 
Thank you, Allison. And also just to let people know that if your child is working and earning wages, those wages reduce their SSI check 50 cents on the dollar. So if your child earns $1,000 in a month, that will reduce their SSI check by $500. So in a lot of cases, that's worth it. So we've talked about income. Let's now talk about resources. Your child cannot have more than $2,000 in countable resource. So what I what they call a resource, I would call an asset. There are certain things that do not count against your child, and that would be if your child owns a house or a condo, a car, personal items, and 529 education accounts. So what they do count is anything else in your child's name, if there are any checking or savings accounts, investment accounts. If you have a uniform transfer to minor account, this is a custodial account that some people set up for their child. When your child turns 21, they have a right to that money and it will count against them. Of course, if they own any real estate, that's not a homestead. I do want Trusty, to- Trusty, I always like people to be aware of CDs because grandma and grandpa liked to buy our kids CDs back when they were little. And it's something that's out of sight and it's out of mind and we don't even think about it. And I have seen CDs creep up and mess things up for SSI. So I just want to- have people be aware that the CDs do count. And um, so you, you want to check on those for sure. And, and those mm -hmm. CDs, just so you know, if you do have them and those CDs are over $2,000, they can easily be moved to an ABLE account. That is a legitimate move, um, but it would be counted otherwise if it's not in the right bucket. And then I do want to make you aware of how your child's government benefits may change. If a parent takes Social Security retirement, or if they die and they paid into the Social Security system, if your child was disabled prior to the age of 22, they will be eligible for what we call Disabled Adult Child Benefit, DAC. Now, Social Security now calls it something much more vague than that, but that's what this is. If your child was disabled as a child, when you take Social Security retirement, your child will receive benefits based on your work history, and they will get half of what your Social Security check is. So if you retire and your Social Security check is $3,000, your child will get $1,500 in DAC benefits. They won't get SSI anymore because that $1,500 is more than SSI. But the great thing about this is once your child has been getting DAC for two years, then they get Medicare. So they'll have Medicaid plus Medicare. So for a lot of my clients, that's the golden ticket because a lot of doctors don't take Medicaid, but they too do take Medicare. Now there are over 40 different Medicaid waiver programs in Texas with different requirements. Make sure your child is on the wait list. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, maybe contact um, Natalie, they can help you with that. And a lot of you are probably experienced in this area and know that it sounds like there are a lot of programs that's very generous, but it's not. So you have to be on the wait list for some of those programs for over 15 years. So two programs that are not based on financial need. You hear about SSDI, that is not SSI, Social Security Disability. So part of my paycheck goes to Social Security. And if I became disabled, I could make a claim for Social Security disability based on my work record. So that's not what we're talking about today. And then Medicare, that is health care for people over 65 and then some people with disabilities. Those are not based on financial need. When we're doing planning for a family, the parents may wonder, will my child need government benefits? What if you've got a high functioning child uh, you know they're going to be able to work. You're not sure if they will be self-sufficient or not. Um, I recommend for families, if you think there's a possibility that your child might need government benefits in the future, go ahead and leave that option open. Go ahead and create a special needs trust for your child uh, because we don't want to close that door. Because I will tell you that 15 years ago, if a child had pre-existing conditions, they could not get private health insurance. Medicaid was the only game in town. Now we have the Affordable Care Act and they cannot be denied insurance because of the pre-existing condition. So 
we don't know what the government programs are going to look like. I mean, your child may live for decades and decades. We don't know what Medicaid or SSI or anything is going to look like then. So I like to tell parents, keep that option open so that if they need government benefits, they can be eligible. So that brings us to special needs trusts. What makes them so special? We know that if as parents, we pass away, we know government benefits are not going to be enough for our child to live on. We know that we have something to leave them, but we want to supplement what they get from benefits and not have them lose it if they need it. So that's the magic of a special needs trust. The assets in a special needs trust do not count against your child as a resource if it is done properly. You could have an unlimited amount of money in this trust and it won't count against them. Distributions from the trust for your child's care don't count as income if it's done correctly. The result is that trust will supplement the government benefits, but not supplant it. So the result is just a better life for your child. What is a trust? Obviously, it's a legal document that we prepare. But when we're working for a child with special needs, it's going to be a blueprint for the future care of your child. It's going to discuss the people that will be involved, how the money is going to be used, create a safety net for your child. When we draft a special needs trust, qualifying your child for government benefits is not the only reason that we create a special needs trust for your child. When I draft a trust, I draft it with flexibility for changed circumstances so that if your child needs government benefits, it operates as a special needs trust. If your child does not need government benefits, then it operates as a regular trust. But also, you don't want to leave assets outright to your child, even if they don't need government benefits. Because if you leave it outright to your child, could your child manage those assets wisely? Could they invest that money wisely? Could they make wise decisions on how much to use each month and what to use it for? Also, if you leave assets to your child outright, that money is not protected. Your child could be taken advantage of, and I have seen this. So if your child inherits money outright, they might have friends, so-called friends coming out of the woodwork, and they'll say to your child, hey, invest in my company, and I'll double your money in a month. And of course, that money's gone, and then your child has nothing. So if you leave it to them in a trust, that money can be protected. It can be protected from predators, protected from creditors, protected from divorce. Also, in our trust, we might embed some advocacy for your child as well, especially if your child is not able to advocate on their own behalf. Now, there are two main types of special needs trust. We have a first-party trust and a third-party trust. A first-party trust is created with your child's own money. So in, if they inherited money outright from a relative, or we'll talk about child support in a minute, or they had their own savings account, they could put that into a first-party trust. But the biggest thing I want you to remember about first-party trust is that it has a Medicaid payback provision. That means that when your child dies, whatever is left in that trust is first going to pay Medicaid back for whatever they have spent on behalf of your child for your child's entire lifetime. So sometimes if people don't plan ahead, we end up with a first party trust. Now a third party trust is created with someone else's money. It was money that was never your child's to begin with. So if you're a parent and we're doing estate planning for you, we're leaving your assets to a special needs trust for your child upon your death, that's a third party trust. The great thing about a third party trust is it does not have a Medicaid payback provision. So when your child dies, this money is not going to the government. Instead, it will go to whoever you have named as a contingent beneficiary in the trust. If you have other children, maybe you named other children as beneficiaries or other relatives or charities or whatever, you get to choose where it goes. So not everybody needs a first party trust. Those are for certain situations, but every family needs a third party trust. That's mostly what we're gonna talk about today. So how does your money get into this third party special needs trust? You're gonna have a will. When I work with a family, we do wills for the parents so that your will would leave 
that child's share to the special needs trust. So my husband and I have one daughter, her name is Jordan. So my husband and I are leaving everything to each other. And then when we both pass away, it will go into Jordan's trust. And then life insurance. Life insurance is a great way to fund the future care of your child. And it doesn't get to your child through the will. It is distributed by beneficiary designation. So for my husband and I, we are each other's primary beneficiary. And then our contingent beneficiary is Jordan's trust. IRAs and 401ks. And, and um, these are also distributed by beneficiary designation. So just like life insurance, my husband and I are each other's primary beneficiary. Our contingent beneficiary might be Jordan's trust. And also gifts. You may have grandparents that want to put money in this trust or leave money to the trust. You can. So for a lot of families, that third-party trust will have nothing in it until the parents pass away. And that is fine. You don't have to put money into it now if you don't have a reason. So this shows the funnel upon your death. Assets through your will, your life insurance, retirement would go into the special needs trust. IRAs and 401ks into special needs trust. This is amazing. So if you've got IRAs and 401ks, and I'm just going to call them IRAs to be short, you are earning income on those, but you're not paying income tax. And then that income earns income the next year. So you've got tax-free compounding. You won't pay income tax until you retire and take money out. Now, if you're married, you would leave that to your spouse. They do a spousal rollover. They get those tax benefits as well. But what if the parents pass away and it goes to kids? If you leave those IRAs to a child who's not a special needs child, not disabled, they are subject to a new rule that is a 10-year payout. So if you leave it to the non-disabled child, they will have to cash it out within 10 years of reaching the age of majority. So if they're an adult, they have to cash it out within 10 years. They can either cash it out within one year of your death, wait till the 10th year, take 10 annual installments. But whatever that is, they're going to add that to their personal income, and that will determine their income tax bracket and their rate. So 10-year payout means they're going to pay much higher income taxes. But there is an exception to that 10-year payout, and that's for individuals who are disabled. So an individual who is disabled is not, is not subject to that 10-year payout. Instead, they get a lifetime stretch. That means that money can grow tax deferred for your child's lifetime. So another generation of tax-free compounding, and this can be huge. So this chart shows that if the clients had a combined million dollars in retirement accounts, if it earned a rate of 6%, this shows how that money could grow to about $5 million because of that tax-free compounding. Now, the light green you see on the chart, that would be their required minimum distribution, RMD. Your child's RMD would not start when they're at retirement age. They would start within one year of you passing away. But the amount of that distribution is based on your child's life expectancy, according to an IRS single life chart. So when you pass away, if we plug your child's age into that chart, if it says that their life expectancy is 40 years, then the distribution the first year will be about 1 40th of that account, the next year 1 39th, and so on. So income tax hit is going to be much smaller. Your child with disabilities might be in a lower income tax bracket, and you've got that compounding. Now, we don't want to leave it outright to your child because obviously that would be income. A lot of trusts do not qualify for this tax deferred growth. But when I'm drafting a special needs trust that might be the recipient of an IRA or a beneficiary of, then I draft it with special language so that it qualifies for this tax deferred growth. So when I have clients that have more than one child, because of the new law, some of my clients are leaving all of their IRAs to the special needs trust. And then maybe other assets to the other kids because the other assets are not subject to income tax on your child. Child support, this is huge. And a lot of people are not familiar with this. So child support can be ordered in Texas beyond the age of 18 if the child is disabled. 
But when they're 18 and they're applying for SSI, that child support will count against your child as income, regardless of whose name is on that check. So how do we avoid that? We had a situation where um, a parent was ordered to pay $950 in child support. Well, that's more than the $941 of SSI. So the child lost SSI and Medicaid. And for this child, Medicaid was essential for the survival of the child. The child was going to die without Medicaid. So there's a way to avoid this. And the way we avoid it is that we create a first party special needs trust. Now, I don't do family law. I don't do child support and divorce, but I work with the family law attorney because that child support decree that the judge signs has to have special magic language required by social security so that the child support is ordered to be paid into a first party special needs trust. Then it does not count against your child as income. And then the parent that's the trustee then uses that money each month. So we're kind of funneling that child support through that trust in order to not disqualify the child. So if you're in this situation or if you know of anybody that is, um, be aware of this. A lot of family law attorneys are not aware of it. So let's go back to our third party trust. Let's say that you've passed away. There's money in the trust for your child. What can it be used for? First, let's talk about what it cannot be used for. The trustee cannot give cash to your child or their caregiver because that's considered income for SSI and Medicaid purposes. Typically, your trustee is not going to pay for things that government benefits pay for. What can it be used for? Essentially, anything that you would have used the money for yourself, as long as it's for your child. So all of their personal needs, social, recreational, entertainment, education, medical, so therapies, things that are not paid for by health insurance or government benefits, um, all their supplements, their clothing, going um, to the movies, their activities, getting their hair cut, um, their furniture, their bedding, all of those things the trust can pay for. So how does your trustee pay for these things? They cannot give you cash. I don't recommend the trustee use a debit card. That could be interpreted as cash. So the trustee can pay third parties directly. So if your child is attending um, uh, High Point Village and they're paying money, the trustee can pay them every month directly. But what about all those miscellaneous expenses, you know, cell phone, um, haircuts, all of those things? The trustee, there could be a credit card that is used for your child, and then the trustee pays that off with the trust bank account each month. But the best tool that our trustees have is called a True Link credit card. And you can get this online at truelinkfinancial.com. This is a preloaded card. And so let's say that your trustee wants your child to have $500 a month for miscellaneous expenses. Then the trustee can take $500 from the trust bank account, load it onto this card at the beginning of the month, and then your child or their caregiver can use it for your child's needs. The cool thing about TrueLink is that your trustee can limit where it can be used and what it can be used for. So, for example, if your trustee does not want to use it for food and shelter, they don't want that one third reduction, they can limit it so it cannot be used for food and shelter. So your child could use that card to go buy a movie ticket, but they could not use it to buy popcorn in the movie. Um, or there might be something that is not helpful for your child. Um, if there's a, an individual that maybe alcohol is a problem for them, they can limit it so that it cannot be used for alcohol. So different things like that. Um, so it's a great tool for our trustees. So we've talked a lot about your trustee. Who is this person? So let's talk about what your trustee is going to do. And again, this is after you pass away. If you're living, you would be the trustee, but you've passed away. There's money you save for this trust. Your trustee is going to work with your financial team to make sure that money is invested properly. Your trustee has to be willing to learn how to make distributions without affecting your child's government benefits. They don't need to know today how to do that, but they have to be willing to learn and willing to follow those rules. And then your trustee has discretion about whether to make a distribution for your child's care or not. So this is the person that's gonna decide whether this is a good use of the money or not. 
When your child asks for money, the trustee is the one that's going to say yes or no. They have to keep good financial records and they're going to hire an accountant to file a tax return. Now, the trust will pay for all of their expenses in administering the trust. Your trustee could be paid a fee if you want them to be paid a fee. So who are you going to choose? You're going to choose a successor trustee upon your death and then probably a one or two other successors. So if that person dies, you've got some other people in line. This can be a family member. It can be friends. They can hire the professional assistance they need. But there also are corporate trustees, trust companies. And in Texas, we're blessed with several really good trust companies that specialize in administering special needs trusts. So you would have a trust officer that would serve as your trustee, and they would work with your family to determine what your child's needs are and then make distributions. So one of the advantages of a corporate trustee is that you're taking a burden, all this hard work, off of an individual and putting it on a trust company. Um, they owe a fiduciary duty to do what's in the best interest of your child, and they take that duty very seriously. Also, they're used to dealing with a beneficiary with special needs, whether your child's special need is physical, intellectual, mental health, whatever, they're used to dealing with it. They have compassion um, for their beneficiaries and, and get to know them. The disadvantage, of course, is they have to charge a fee. Obviously, it's a business. That fee is not charged until you pass away. There's money in the trust. Um, typically, it's about 1.2 to 1.4 percent of the trust assets per year for the first million. If you have more than a million, it's a smaller percentage after that. So, if you've got a million dollars goes into that trust, that would be 12 to 14 thousand a year. So, some of our clients believe that's worth it. Um, for my husband and I, we do have a corporate trustee for our daughter. Um, I have a brother that I would trust to do it, but I don't want her to have to ask money from my brother because if he says no, that might affect the relationship. And to me, the relationship is more important than the money. Also be aware the ARC of Texas has a master pooled trust. We use this sometimes for smaller trusts. Now in your trust, we're gonna name um, a trustee. But I may ask you to provide me with three to five names of people that would serve on a trust advisory committee after you pass away. This is going to be a support team for your child so they can advocate on behalf of your child to the trustee. So they're going to all work together to determine what's in your child's best interest. If you've got a corporate trustee, they will help create the budget, help determine your child's needs and, uh, and get those needs met. If you have a corporate trustee named, we will also give your trust advisory committee the power to fire and hire that corporate trustee because we can draft a trust today and we can name a great trust company, but this trust might last for decades and this trust company in 20 years might be bought out and the company that buys them out may not do a good job for your child. So we want your committee to be able to fire them and then hire a different corporate trustee that's going to do a good job. So we don't have a corporation running your child's life. What happens if you don't have a special needs trust? What if you leave them nothing? If you leave your child nothing, then all they have to live on is $9.14 a month in Medicaid. It's not going to be enough. You don't want to leave anything to them outright because it's not protected. It wouldn't be wisely used and they lose that option to be eligible for government benefits. But also don't leave assets outright to other family members. We saw with our scenario with Sister Susan that she died and the parents' money went to her family instead of Andrew. But also, what if Sister Susan um, commingled that money and got divorced? That money could be lost, or she got sued for an accident, or developed a gambling addiction, whatever. That money's not protected if you leave it outright to a family member. So we know that you need a third-party trust. What else do you need? Well, you need the will. But also, if your child is a minor or if they might need a guardian as an adult, if both parents pass away, the court is going to appoint a guardian. And I want you to be able to choose who that is. So we do a document for our clients called the Declaration of Guardian for Your Child. So you can say who you would want to be your child's guardian if the parents pass away. Beneficiary designations. Um, I would say that 
99% of the people that come see me for the first time, their beneficiary designations don't do what they think they're going to do. We're talking about life insurance, IRAs, 401ks, and the like. So I actually work with my clients. I ask them to get the beneficiary designation change forms and get those to me so that I can help make sure the trust is named properly on those forms. We also coordinate with other family members. I give my clients a letter that they can give to grandparents or other family members that they can give to their attorney. So if they want to leave something to your child's trust, they can update their will or trust to do that. Also, my clients are the parents. I'm also doing powers of attorney for my parents because we're not just planning on if you die. We're also planning on if you were incapacitated for a period of time. We want you to have financial medical power of attorney, different documents in place so that if you're in the hospital and can't take care of things, we've got people with legal ability to step in to take care of you and the children. So as you can see, we take a holistic approach to this. Um, special needs trust is not alone is not sufficient. Um, we work with your financial team as well. We like to be a team together. When do you need to create a special needs trust? Before you die or become incapacitated. We don't know when that is, so just as soon as you can, the sooner you're going to have peace of mind. So what is the result of wise planning? If you do this right, you're going to have a financial plan. And Allison was talking about the great work that, that they do to create that financial plan to pay for your child's care. You're going to have a support team in place for your child. You may have instructions for their care, but they're going to retain the option to be eligible for government benefits if they need it. And the result is well-being for your child, a more fulfilling life. So let's go back through our scenarios. What if the parents had done this right? So if you'll remember with Izzy, her parents did no planning. All their assets went to her outright. She didn't have the right legal counsel. Her money ran out and she ended up living in an institution. But what if Izzy's parents had created a third party special needs trust for Izzy and their will left assets to that trust? Their life insurance and retirement accounts named that trust as a beneficiary. What that means is when they passed away, all of that would go into a trust and the trustee would use that for Izzy's care. She would keep that basic level of government benefits, the SSI of 914, Medicaid, but the Medicaid waiver programs that were paying for attendant care, nursing supplies, all of that basic level would be paid for. And then what her parents left her would supplement that. And together, that would give her a good quality of life. So instead of an institution, she would have options. She could choose to stay in her home and have caregivers come in, or she could buy, live in a condo or a group home or whatever she chose, she would have that choice. And she would not have ended up in an institution. She could have kept her friends, her online business, her blog, and she would have continued to have a great life. Now, Andrew, again, everything went to Susan. She died. Everything went to um, her family and not to Andrew. What if her parents instead left it to a special needs trust for Andrew and then named Susan as the trustee? Well, then when Susan died, that money would not have gone to her family. It would have stayed in the special needs trust for Andrew. The parents would have named a successor trustee who would step in and manage the trust assets for Andrew after Susan died. And what that means is he would have been able to stay in the more expensive group home that he liked. He could have stayed with the guys that he liked, with his activities and his comfort zone, instead of having to live with the mean guys in a different town. Now, Kyle, you know, his dad had a special needs trust and assets went there, but he named Uncle Bob as the trustee. And Uncle Bob didn't know him, moved Kyle to another state. Kyle um, lost all of his support system. What if the dad had named in his trust a trust advisory committee? What if he had named three to five people here in Texas that knew Kyle? Well, then they could have advocated to Uncle Bob and said, no, Uncle Bob, we don't want him to move to that state. We will support Kyle here in Texas. And if that had occurred, Kyle could have stayed here, kept his job at Kroger, kept all of his friends and all of his social support system, and would have continued to have a great life. 
All right, so um, that's all the PowerPoint um, issues we have. If we can help you guys in any way, feel free to give us a call if you are a Texas resident. And I'm going to stop sharing. And um, Allison, you may open up for questions. Yep, I think I am going to start sharing. Um, so um, for Trustee, we did have a question. Um, that basically what if somebody accidentally leaves money um, to our child and um, so can we set up a first party special needs trust after the fact what what happens when that happens and then become eligible again for SSI and Medicaid once we get that worked out so it depends if it is the result of a beneficiary designation for life insurance or retirement yes our solution is the first party trust but if it's a will, let's say that granddad had a will that left assets to your child outright, Texas law allows us to go to court to have that will modified to create a special needs trust. So we would have a court modification of the will or if grandfather had a, a trust. So it depends on how that was inherited. But yes, there are things that we can do. So the, the, the bottom line of, of that is when that happens, you do um, need a, an attorney. And, and if you've attended any of our webinars in the past, um, I am a fan and an advocate of our situation with a special needs child is specialized. You do want to work with a specialist. I am not a fan of hiring your brother, the real estate attorney. I mean, even though he might do it for free, it might not be right do work with a professional that is really nuanced and special needs. It's, it is super, super important to preserve their eligibility for these programs. Um, and not all is lost. I mean, you know, you can count it as a blessing if somebody leaves your child money. It's ideal if they leave it, um, you know, in the right buckets. But one thing that I mentioned is, you know, is just like we, having those conversations of power of attorney and healthcare power of attorney with parents, have intentional conversations with um, aging parents parents, grandparents, or people that love your child that might want to leave them money. And we do know that a lot of, um, a lot of folks um, keep their money cards close to their chest and they might not necessarily want to talk about it. But guess what? They do love their chi your child. Their financial advisor is not likely nuanced in, in special needs. And um, when they say we have this grandson that we love so much and we want to leave him some money, the advisor says, okay, and they set the beneficiary up wrong. And, and that commonly happens. And your parents um, love these kids so much. They do want to do it right, but they need some help and some um, ideas and guidance. So having, you know, carefully planned conversations, you don't have to get in the weeds with what money or what they're even thinking, but just saying, listen, we've been doing this planning ourselves and planning for the future of little Johnny. And we learned that we can't leave money outright to him for the following reasons. And we wanted to share this information with you as a good, good, good conversation starter. Um, but I would say, make a point to have these conversations. And I know, um, Tressie, some attorneys like even have like um, maybe a list or um, kind of conversation points or, or even documents that you can share um, with a, a parent or, or, or elderly family members. So that way they, they know exactly how to set things up. Do you, do you, or do you know what I'm talking about with that? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's see. Um, I would like to answer there, one of these questions. I'd like to answer one of the questions. Yeah. Somebody, somebody mentioned that their child is employed through TWC and they are setting up a 401k for their child. So not for the parent, for the child. Just be aware that whenever your child is at retirement age in their 70s, they will have required minimum distributions. That will count as income, but that won't happen until they're in their 70s. So um, you don't need to point that to a special needs trust if it's your child's 401k. So the one thing um, we had researched that on on that um, trustee is that on these 401ks, the 401ks, an IRA, a simple IRA, a Roth IRA, the 401ks would be counted asset wise. So if they're working full time not... and getting the the 401k. Um, 
so it's what we found was that in Texas, it's not counted in some states. So let's do talk about that. Is that is that something that that is not counted at this point on a 401k? Right. So if your child has their own 401k, I can tell you how Social Security is interpreting it now. The Texas office Social Security does not have a written rule on how they count it, and it could change at any time. But this is our experience, me and other lawyers, we talk to each other. Right now, they're not counting the 401k as a resource. So um, that's not a resource. It's income when they start taking distributions. So again, that's not a guarantee because it's not a written rule. There are so many things in special needs law that are not written um, but this is how they're interpreting it. This is how Social Security is interpreting the rules right now for Texas residents. But that could change. Okay, so a couple of other questions on there. Um, can a special needs trust be used for housing, food, if a child goes to a residential community or group home? Yeah, I mean, the trust can be used for, for food and shelter and then your child's SSI is, be redu is reduced by a third. And in a lot of cases, that's worth it. So we don't mind the one third reduction in a lot of cases, and that's fine. Okay. Um, someone says, I just recently read a medical service agreement where a 13-year-old child could take the parents off of their medical records. Um, do we need to move to guardianship before 18? Um. I, you know, I don't know. I've never seen a guardianship under the age of 18. Typically, guardianships when the child turns 18. So I'm not really understanding the question. So basically, they're saying um, because these hospitals, like, for instance, Texas Children's is saying that the kid has the right to take the parents off their medical records at age 13. Is there any workaround on that is basically what the question is. I am not familiar with that rule, so I don't know. Okay. In the case of someone who has both a special needs trust and an ABLE account, is it advisable that the special needs trust be drafted to have money from the ABLE account go into the special needs trust? And, and I will add, or vice versa, what are the advantages or disadvantages of having the money stay in the ABLE account? So the ABLE account is typically funded with your child's own money. So I call that first party money. So let's say your child has a savings account of $10,000. They're applying for SSI and they've got more than 2,000. So they move that over into an ABLE account. So that money could only go, if it goes into a trust, it can only go into a first party trust and not the parent's third party. So you need to be really careful not to commingle first party and third party money. That's the main thing to remember. Um, ABLE accounts are good when we're dealing with smaller amounts. You can only put in $17,000 a year. Um, ABLE accounts have a Medicaid payback provision. So do first party trusts. So those are the same as far as Medicaid uh, payback. But parents' money, you shouldn't be putting your money in an ABLE account because if you keep your money in your name, it's going to end up going to a third-party trust with no Medicaid payback provision. So, um, so typically, we don't want parents to put their money in an ABLE account, even though it's tax-advantaged. Um, we have a question out here. Is there any benefit to putting SSI money into a, a special needs trust? Uh, is this allowable? So SSI money, if you need to reduce to get, make sure you're not going over $2,000, can go into a first party special needs trust after you get it. It can't be direct deposited to first party. And it can go to an ABLE account. And so those are the two places the money can go. And so I would say it is advisable if you're about to go over to $2,000 to get it into a place where it's not going to be counted against the individual uh, for SSI and, and Medicaid purposes. Do you have any suggestions on that, Tressie? Yeah, I agree um, with everything you said. Also, I encourage people to use up that SSI money every month. They should not be saving it. So you might be paying for things for your child that you could have your child pay for. So you might be paying for your child's cell phone or um, food or whatever. You should be using SSI to pay you 500 in rent, but also they should be paying their share of all groceries, 
Um, they should be paying for their share of going out to eat their cell phone, their Netflix, their whatever, you should be using that up every month and, and you shouldn't um, you shouldn't have a balance. So it's really about shifting expenses to your child's money instead of out of your own pocket. Um, someone had some questions about an ABLE account. I'm going to direct you guys to the um, Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel. We have a whole webinar on that. We're happy to um, take that offline. We're kind of running out of time for today. <clears throat> Excuse me, but we can also help people get those open. Can I have my um, 401k go to a third-party special needs trust? Um, yes, you can name the third party trust as a beneficiary of your 401k. Okay. Can, uh, okay, so we've not seen a guardianship established before 18 because you are the guardian prior to them um, turning 18. So there's some questions, and again, I'm going to direct to the to the um, webinars on guardianship. On this is a it's, it's it's a slippery slope to have guardianship to not have guardianship. The alternatives to guardianship, supported decision making agreement, um, and so I know that we've done webinars on that on, in the past. And what I like to say is, guys, you don't have to know the answer. All you have to do is work with a qualified attorney and they're going to take you through and explain all of the options. They're going to learn a lot about your child and make the recommendations according to how the law says, the least restrictive, most appropriate. But they're going to help walk you through that. So you don't have to have all the answers. You just need to have a phone number to a qualified attorney that can kind of talk you through um, how that works uh, in Texas. Um, would the and also, the other thing I want to mention is if you have a child that is over 18 and you didn't do guardianship, it's okay. It doesn't mean you never can. Um, if you started out with a power of attorney and whatever was appropriate and then found out that it wasn't appropriate, you can back up and punt. You, I mean, there are there are fixes for things. And so I just want to encourage people because we talked to a lot of people, Trusty, that are you know, it's nervous. It's, it makes everybody nervous when these kids are turning 18 and knowing that not wanting to take their rights away, but wanting to do the best thing. And it, it's hard to know the right answer. So I, I know that you talk to people about that and get really specific about the child and what might be the best route. Um, okay. So can money from a child uh, receiving from the parent social security retirement be put into the special needs trust. So when they're getting those childhood disability benefits or DAC money, could that be put into a special needs trust? Again, I would try to use it up every month. Um, try to shift expenses to use that every month. One person says, can I buy life insurance for my disabled son as long as I am the owner and the beneficiary? The answer is yes. But if you buy a permanent life insurance policy that has cash value, like a whole life or a universal life, and you are not the owner, then that would be a countable asset. So it is important to know that, but it is easily fixed by the parent being the, the owner of that policy. So we're at 102, so we're out of time for today. You guys have asked wonderful questions. And as always, Tressie, you did an amazing job. Thank you um, for sharing all of this information. We'll have another um, another webinar with Tressie. She is a wealth of information. And, and the thing is, is each one of these things that we've talked about, like we could have a whole webinar on the, the Texas Medicaid waivers or the ABLE accounts or the guardianship and things like that. In fact, we do have those out there. So do check those out. I'm so sorry we couldn't get to everything uh, today. You guys are going to get a copy of today's slides. So um, a, a link to the recording and a copy of today's uh, slides. They will have a link for any of the upcoming webinars that we have um, coming up over the next month. And um, the, the contact information for both Trusty and myself, if you like to schedule a consultation and Tressie just real quick before we go um, for for the people I know that you're in Plano and I know that you do set up these documents wills trust um, you know guardianship you do all of these things um, as far as the guardianship and the counties that you're currently working in can you just give us a highlight real quick of those counties so people know yeah, and just to backtrack, special needs trust, we do that for clients all over the state of Texas. We can do Zoom meetings, things like that. Guardianship, we only handle Dallas, 
Denton, Collin, and Rockwall counties. Okay, perfect. If you guys are in other counties and you need help with that, we can certainly make a referral um, for an attorney in your area that, that you can work with. Natalie, thank you so much for partnering with us again today. Thank you everyone for your time. Uh, watch your emails for the slides and the link to the recording and we'll look forward to partnering with you both again soon. Take care. Thank, thank you, Allison. You. Thanks everyone. Bye -bye.